I'm Terry Stola with the Decatur Camera Club, and we're pleased to be here at the Arts Council exhibiting our photographs. Before we look at some of the exhibit and talk about some of the photos in particular, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about composition. Composition is how you arrange things. If you're making a, a book report or writing a story, the things that you are arranging are the words, and you decide which words you want in your story and how to arrange them. If you're doing a musical composition, the things that you arrange are the notes. You decide which notes you want to use, how long the notes should be played, and in which order you want the notes to be played. But in a photograph, the composition is how you arrange things in your photograph. Where you're going to stand, where the primary subject is going to be, and it represents the artistic component of an image. And the nice thing about composition is that it works for any camera. It doesn't matter if you're using a cell phone to take a picture, if you're using a tablet to take a picture, or maybe you're using a camera that's meant only to take pictures. And it's also important that what I'm going to tell you are not rules, but they're just guidelines. And they're guidelines to help you take a better picture. Think about the red line as being the outside of the camera frame or the outside of your picture and the black is what's inside the camera frame what you're going to take a picture of. There's a concept called a rule of thirds in which we divide the inside picture up by nine segments and we do that by making tic-tac-toe grids. Two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. Where the horizontal and the vertical lines intersect we have what we call power points represented by the dark red circle here. And it's it's typically a good thing in a photograph as a guideline to put your main elements of your photograph, what you want the subject to be and the important points, either along one of the lines, up and down, or left or right, or at one of the power points. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. And it works both if you're holding your camera in landscape mode, where it's wider than it is tall, the picture's wider than it is tall, or if you're holding your camera the other way, where it's short along the bottom and the top, and it's kind of tall from bottom to top. That's called the portrait mode. But the same rule of third works both ways, and we should be looking for the power points. Now here's a photograph of Abraham Lincoln at the Macon County Historical Society. And when I took this picture, I wanted to make sure that Mr. Lincoln, the whole statue of Mr. Lincoln, was on the left vertical line, rule of thirds. And you can see that the eye, the one that's not in shadow, but the other eye, is very, very close to the power point that's on the upper left. Another example of composition are leading lines. And they really don't have to be lines. They can also be curves. And what you do is try to use a line or a curve and have your viewer's eye being led from the foreground or the front of the picture all the way to the back where your subject is. So in this case, in the middle of the stream, the stream creates a curved line leading towards a covered bridge, which was the subject of this photograph. Another example of leading lines is this photograph where the primary subject uh, are the windows in the back of the photograph. In this case, the floor, the interface between the, the floor and the wall on the right, and the bottom part of the steps all form lines that lead our eye to the windows, which was the primary subject. Here's a picture of a sunset. The sunset is what the subject is. And because of the way the posts are, the bottoms of the posts lead our eye at a diagonal towards the sun. Diagonal lines in a photograph are also a good thing to have. In this case, the flagpole itself represents a diagonal line, and every soldier's hand and arm and wrist is a diagonal line, and even the fingers are diagonal lines, and diagonal lines can create strong interest. Repeating items in a photograph are also often interesting or a good thing to use in composition. Here there's a column in the front, and three other columns behind it, all forming a, a nice line, repeating in a 
and can create something that's very interesting. This is the inside of a covered bridge and how the wooden structure is put together. And you can see that there are many, many repeating items, lines, shapes, and patterns. A good thing to do in taking a photograph and thinking about a composition is to fill the frame. In other words, get as close as you can to the subject. That way, there aren't a lot of distractions around the outside, and it really highlights the subject. In this case, I stood very, very close to the back of a sunflower and, and eliminated distractions of other sunflowers. In some cases, the backgrounds are very, very distracting, and you have to be careful about what you're going to include or not include in the photograph. In this case, I was inside, and I had somebody hold up a piece of black cloth behind my grandson so I could take a picture of him and not have anything else in the, in the background to distract me. But this is a bad example because I cut off his hands, so I wasn't paying close enough attention as to what was going to be in the frame when I took the picture. In a similar fashion, we shouldn't do this. I didn't pay close attention to the background, and look what happened. It looks like there's a devil's horn coming out of his head, and it's the faucet behind him. I could have easily moved him a little bit, or I could have just shifted my body and camera a little bit to the left and eliminated that being a distraction. We went to Central Park to see Santa Claus, and I was really concerned about what my grandson was doing and interacting with Santa Claus. I didn't pay attention to what was in the background. And look at Santa's head. Well, Santa's wearing a lampshade on his head, and I, I should not have done that when I took the picture. Again, I could have moved a little bit differently or had Santa move. So you just have to be careful when you're taking photographs. And this particular example is uh, a woman, Diane Spaniel, who has got uh, hers displayed in a kind of a unique manner, but it's interesting because she's got butterflies, and she and her husband raise monarch butterflies from the egg stage and through the other stages until they finally emerge as full-grown monarchs. This wall is a selection of animal photographs, wildlife, if you will, and I'd like to point out a couple of things on some of the photographs regarding the rule of thirds, uh, a composition um, guideline that we talked about. In this example, we've got a goose that's swimming in the, what I guess is the lake or a pond, with a tree that's got a nice reflection in the water. And the photographer has placed the goose at the intersection of two lines on the tic-tac-toe grid, kind of right at the power point. And additionally, the tree and its reflection are on the one-third line on the right side. So that's a very good example of how the rule of thirds might make a composition better. In this case, I've got three white pelicans that migrate to Decatur to and from Decatur in the, in the spring and the fall, and here the photographer has placed all three of them kind of at the upper one-third horizontal line. So another good example of the rule of thirds. And it's also interesting to note that in photography, it's usually better to have an odd number of subjects than it is an even number of subjects. For some reason, that's more pleasing. So the fact that there are three pelicans makes it more interesting. Uh, this gray wolf uh, is, is a nice example also of the rule of thirds. The photographer has placed the primary subject roughly at the, at the right hand one third line and the eyes, this eye is about the power point. This particular photographer does a lot of wildlife work and he travels on his vacation time to the Smoky Mountains or to Yellowstone and, and captures stunning images like this. Uh, Larry Holder took this photograph of a, of a mallard and it's a perfect example of the rule of thirds. The intersection of the vertical line on the left and the top one third line is right dead on uh, where the mallard, did, mallard is and the mallard is nicely in focus and he's taken it so that the background is blurred, so everything is highlighting the mallard itself. Uh, this photograph is one that I submitted, and it's actually five photographs. It's a composition. Composition is where we put things together. So I took a sequence of photographs uh, of a bluebird box. I knew that the bluebirds were feeding their young because I was observing them over the month of May. 
and I set my camera on a tripod so it would be very still and I had a remote shutter release. I could click the shutter, hold it down, and when I held it down, the shutter would go click, 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 click to get me five images in a sequence and I could blend them together using Photoshop. And this, this turned, out to, turned out to be pretty nice. So five photographs, all within a second or less than a second. This is the landscape wall, if you will. We've got a half a dozen or eight photographs uh, this particular photograph is one of mine. It's hanging on our fireplace when it's not here at the exhibit. But it's a photograph that I took in Australia during a trip, and it's called the Lock Art Gorge. It's called the Lock Art Gorge because there was a ship sometime in the 1800s that had a shipwreck out beyond here. And uh, this photograph is along the Great Ocean Road on the southern coast of Australia. There are several places where there are these limestone formations. And an interesting thing about this photograph, I think, is that the primary subject are these two formations, and they're really framed by the vegetation in the foreground and the, and the cliffs on the right-hand and left-hand side. And also, an important thing to do in composition, when there is a horizon that should be horizontal, so left to right, not slanted up or down. Uh, it's very important that that horizon be horizontal. And this may be, this is one of my favorite photographs uh, of this section also. It's taken of the Grand Canyon at sunset and the photographer did a really, really nice job of again keeping the horizon horizontal but capturing the light and the moodiness of the Grand Canyon. And certainly the photographer who uh, took this picture, uh, Jim Spaniel, one of our members, um, took a nice photograph of, number one, it's very colorful. Number two, there are repeating elements. Every guitar or ukulele is a little bit different. And uh, he did a really nice job of putting it together. Sometimes photographers will take multiple images and then put them together much like we much like I did for the five bluebird photos. And this is one example of a photographer in the club was very, very creative. She had photographs of her granddaughter. This is the same photograph put in the photo five times and a photograph of her grandson in front of a, I think the piano keyboard was, keyboard was probably another photograph, but she made a composite, so she put those photographs together and made this image, and I think it's a, it's a real keepsake for her. Um, shortly after the COVID virus started and everybody was locked down here in Illinois, I decided I would take pictures of my grandkids. I had photographs that I'd taken of my grandkids, and I superimposed masks on each one of them. And just for Posterity, I hope this never happens again in our lifetime and their lifetime, but I call this one the quarantine kids. And now we'll, we'll take a look at some black and white photographs. Uh, let's, let's, let's start with this one. This is, this is interesting only because of the way I did it. This was a photograph that I took in during a trip to uh, the Netherlands. So it's where the area where the tulips grow. Um, my wife and I were walking to a museum one misty morning and I just had my camera with me and I snapped this photograph of a, a guy, I don't remember if he's walking towards us or away from us, but with an umbrella. But the interesting part of it was that the, the sky at the time I took the picture was a boring white sky. You couldn't see clouds, you could just see that it was probably a, not a very good day, maybe misting a little bit. So a few days later, uh, I took a photograph outside of Paris in the Palace of Versailles and during that day it was a very, very cloudy, stormy day and I took another picture just of clouds. So I was able to, when I got home, combine the photograph of the clouds with the, the original photograph, replaced the sky, converted it to black and white and it turned out really nice. Um, the man with the umbrella is really the primary subject He's kind of at the right one-third line. In fact, the umbrella may be right at the PowerPoint that we talk about in composition.
And there are lots of diagonal lines, leading lines that lead us, lead our eyes to look at him. That was a very, very effective photograph. In the same manner, uh, with respect to leading lines, this photograph taken by uh, Virginia Kickle, one of our one of our long-term members and a member who likes to travel and take photos when she travels. This was a photograph taken in Iceland, and it was during the winter time. They had primarily gone there to see the northern lights, but she used leading lines of the fence row to lead us to the mountains. And the mountains are kind of on the one-third line, the top one-third line, left to right. But it, it provides a very, very nice um, image of how stark the landscape is in Iceland, especially in the wintertime. Let's take a look at this one. This is, this is interesting. Um, so this image is from Sally McGuire. It's called Mustering the Courage. And you don't, you don't know from the photograph, but she's told me afterwards that these people were on the way to see the 9-11 memorial in New York City. And you can see that the, the three women, uh, the primary subject, I would say, subjects, I would say, are each holding each other's hands and are, and are as she implied in the title, are mustering the courage to, to go to the memorial itself. And she said it was a very humbling experience. And what makes the photograph is those three folks holding their hands, but also the shadows. The light is on the opposite side of the people, the primary light, and they're creating shadows that come down below them. And, it, and in a black and white photograph, shadows make all the difference. So this photograph is called The Doctor. It's by Kurt Knapp. Kurt is the same photographer who did The Gray Wolf and who travels to the Smokies and travels to... Uh, uh, Wyoming and, and Yellowstone to take photographs. He also goes over to Hannibal, Missouri during the Steampunk Festival. And at that festival, various characters uh, dress up with kind of outlandish outfits, but he's, he's captured this guy. And what's important about this photograph, I think, is it's nice that the background is white. And in photography, we talk about that being a high-key photograph. And we've seen We'll see a couple other examples of that, um, but he's got he's got you know, maybe the left vertical line on the rule of thirds, and probably his face area on the rule of thirds. And, but when you're taking a photograph of a person or an animal, it's very critical that the eyes are in sharp focus. So Kurt's done a nice job of capturing that, and it's a fun photograph. Uh, photographs can be printed on paper. And then, kind of like these are, um, attached to a mat, which is included in a frame. So this is the mat that's got four photographs, another one that's got four photographs, this mat just has one. But you can also have photographs printed on other materials. The Grand Canyon photograph we saw earlier is printed on metal. The photograph that I showed you about the uh, the Netherlands, with the guy with the umbrella, that's, put, that's also printed on metal. And some of these photographs are printed on canvas. And the canvas is printed, and then the canvas is wrapped around a wooden frame, and it's called a gallery wrap, or a canvas wrap. But here, Sally has photographed uh, flowers, and she captured it in a way that the background is totally white and just a little bit of color in the front, and it really makes an effective photograph. And Sally has, in fact, done a pair of them. So the one on the far right side is another high-key photograph of Iris, not the same flowers, but uh, very similar. And I just wanted to point out that high-key is a good thing. Uh, if we look at a couple of these photographs, there's a series of four photographs from Faith Karash uh, of lilies, what Faith has done is filled the frame up when she's taken the photograph. So there's nothing much in each photograph besides the flower itself. And that's an important concept also when you're taking flowers. 
taking pictures of flowers or people or anything, it's sometimes very important and very helpful to fill the frame up and get as close as you can. Let's take a look at the, the picture of the wind turbines uh, at, at what I believe is, I thought it was sunset, but it's sunrise. It's called Windmill Sunrise. And, of course, like we talked about the rule of thirds, the sunrise is at about the lower right power point. I would say the largest windmill on the left is very near this point, is very near the upper left power point, and there's kind of a diagonal line this way that tends to lead our, lead our eyes to the rising sun. And again, we talked about it earlier in a different photograph, but he's made sure that the horizon where the field interfaces with the sky is perfectly level, and that's, a, that's an excellent thing to do. So this example is the lunar eclipse, the blood moon, on September, and uh, that was September last year, I'm sure. But there are certain times of the year when the moon rises and becomes an orange color. Well, here Sally has put together one photograph as the base, and then she's got one, two, three, four, five additional photographs that she's made a composite of. And um, it makes for an interesting photograph in the, in the moon um, in different phases throughout the same day. Our photographer, everybody has seen the transfer house, I'm sure. You probably drive by it multiple times in a week. But the photographer, Bill Hoffman, photographed the transfer house. And I know it wasn't snowing when he photographed it, but Bill was able to, in Photoshop, Add the, add the snow and make it look like it was a, a real thing. So whenever you're looking at a photograph, um, it's very easy these days to Photoshop something or make a composite, make something that's not really what you would see. And you have to kind of think about that when you're looking at any photograph and ask yourself whether it's, it's real or not. That's a good example. We've talked before about... Uh, the importance of diagonal lines and leading lines. And uh, there's lots of diagonal lines from the bridge and from the structure that this is. Um, but a fun part about this one are these lights, where the lights look like stars. Those are just lights that are on the bridge. And even the lights under the bridge across the river, every light is a starburst. And photographers have a way of doing that by um, having their camera setting so that the aperture, the opening that lets the light in, is very, very small. And when that aperture is very, very small, it doesn't let much light in, so the shutter the, has to be open for a longer period of time. And when you have that condition, then it can often create these uh, starburst effects, and it's, it's a neat effect when it's done right. Here we have the uh, 911 memorial that's uh, by, right in front of the Beach House restaurant on Lake Decatur. And the photographer, uh, Dave Castor, has, has put the memorials generally on the left side, left one third line, as we talked in our rule of thirds. Um, issues. And this photograph is especially nice because it's at night and the lights are lit and there aren't very many distracting elements here. So it, it turned out to be a nice photograph of the memorial. Another example of uh, travel photography, and I think this is in Italy, but it, it's in somewhere in Europe where there was an Italian restaurant. And the photographer uh, took this photograph. He made sure that after he had taken the photograph that things are vertical. And we talked about before horizons should be horizontal. He made sure that things that are vertical, like the door frames, are really vertical. And you can do that within software after you've taken the picture. It's nice to do it as you're taking the picture, but sometimes you have to fix it. But he's processed this photograph so it's kind of an old-timey look. And I would say the most important part of this photograph is probably this 
gentleman who's wearing the red apron. Um, red is is known to be a very, very important color in photography, and it's often the first place somebody's eyes go to if there's something red in the photograph, whether it's a cap or a jacket or an apron, like in this case. Thanks for joining me on the, on the tour of the exhibit at the Decatur Area Arts Council. Uh, the photographers have, have had a lot of fun putting it together. You can see more photos by Decatur Camera Club members or learn more about the organization at thedecaturcameraclub.org. The exhibit at the Decatur Area Arts Council will be open through September 25th from 9 to 4 on Monday through Friday and 10 to 2 on Saturday.